and a lot of people who already joined and happy new year to all of you. Uh, today we are going to discuss about the holistic approach to nuclear competition of aorta. All right, what's the approach to the neonatal co-optation? Clinical presentation, what are the indications of uh, indications for intervention? It can be balloon dilatation, stenting of re or native co-optation, surgical, and what are the outcomes of that? So presence of weak femoral pulses correctly identifies neonates with co-optation. Any, all in all NIC rounds, you should always uh, check for the femoral pulses whatever may uh, be the presentation of the uh, neonate. That's mandatory. So it was showed in a study that isolated upper to lower extremity blood pressure difference of more than 20 millimeters of mercury has a sensitivity rate of about 92%. An important differential diagnosis of shock in the neonatal period is left ventricle outflow obstruction, including co-optation. So in a patient presence with shock, you should definitely uh, don't, don't forget to uh, check the femoral pulses. Unfortunately, in infants below six months of age with co-optation and cardiac failure, diagnosis can be mistaken for sepsis or pulmonary disease in almost half of the cases. So there is a huge importance of checking the femoral pulses because these neonatal co-optations can present in a very varied manner in different uh, types of presentation. So let's go into diagnosis, antenatal diagnosis. Fetal echocardiography can correctly identify co-optation in about 30 to 70 percent of cases. Now in fetal echo, co-optation is often a uh, difficult diagnosis. So what I look for is uh, asymmetry of the size of the great vessels or ventricles and narrowing of the aortic arch. These things might provide a clue to the diagnosis of co-optation. Because of the presence of ductal large and the original large, these confusions come. So you have to look for uh, additional uh, information to identify quark in fetal echo. An antenatal diagnosis definitely improves survival and perioperative clinical outcome. In a comparative study, infants with postnatal diagnosis of coarctation had significant increase in the perioperative morbidity and mortality secondary to ventricular dysfunction, and end organ failure. <clears throat> CT angiography is a, uh, before, I mean, to start with definitely an echocardiography, post uh, delivery is the basic tool for diagnosis of neonatal co-optation. Of course, CT angiography gives you uh, uh, beautiful images of uh, co-optation, the distribution of the co-optation, the association of the uh, head and neck vessels with the co-optation, the position of the ductus, everything. So multi-detector CT angiography can provide excellent diagnosis. The advantage is it is acquired very rapidly and as gating is not required. But you have to expose the patient to radiation. MRI again is another very uh, significant development. But then for neonatal co-optations, we usually uh, don't go for uh, MRI because they are easily diagnosed by uh, echocardiography and CT scan, CT angio. But this MRI definitely gives uh, uh, much clearer images. So what are the therapeutic options? You can do a medical management for co-optation, mild co-optation. You can do surgical repair, balloon dilatation, or stent implantation. So medical management like borderline obstructions, regular assessment of femoral pulses and cold limb blood pressure should be done. Infusion with <coughs> sorry, prostaglandin E1 should be initiated promptly in neonates who develop cardiac failure or shock. And these patients often require mechanical ventilation, correction of acidosis, and very judicious use of anotropic agent. But unless you have relieved a co-optation, you are not supposed to start very high dose anotropes because that's going to um, kick the heart against a forward obstruction. So once you've relieved the co-optation, then the role of anotropes, are, uh, there they come. 
So prostaglandin dilates the ductus and minimizes the obstruction in 80% of neonates up to 28 days of age within a mean of about <coughs> three hours. Effective dose of prostaglandin varies between 0.002 to 0.1 microgram per kg per minute. And observation suggests that more than 28 days of age and weight more than 4 kgs are associated with PGE1 failure. That is, in short, beyond a month of age, prostaglandin usually uh, don't work. Uh, side effects of prostaglandin, like major side effects occurred uh, and in 12 to 16 percent of infants in this particular study and related to low birth weight less than 2 kgs, prolonged use like more than 48 hours, arterial infusion and high dose more than 0.1 max per kg per minute. And the most <coughs> common side effects were respiratory depression, cutaneous vasodilatation, rhythm disturbances and uh, seizures and hyperthermia. But definitely, prostaglandin should be given to a patient who, uh, in a setup where you have uh, uh, provisions for uh, um, ventilation, definitely, especially high dose of prostaglandin. But in peripheral uh, centers where this is diagnosed, prostaglandin might be started in a low dose without any problem. So what is the treatment of choice in uh, native coarctation? This is the question. What is the treatment of choice in, in native coarctation? I see a lot of people already have joined. Anyone, please? I don't see any of my fellows because probably they are all sleeping, it's quite cold in Calcutta today. Yeah, everyone agrees that it is surgical repair. All right. So, surgical treatment is definitely the treatment of choice in neonatal co-optation. So, among the different techniques, end-to-end -end anastomosis is, most, is the most widely used and has the best long-term results usually performed by lateral thoracotomy without CP bypass unless you require a serious uh, arch reconstruction. And, and that is mostly required when you are dealing with some hyperplastic left heart with a very hyperplastic aortic arch and stuff. But otherwise, usually coax are repaired by lateral thoracotomy without a bypass. Median stenotomy in the presence of associated cardiac lesions such as ventricular septal defect or when extensive arch reconstruction is required, that also you can go through median stenotomy. <coughs> the most common complication after surgery is recurrent coarctation, about 3 to 4 percent, and residual hypertension is about 25 to 38 percent. But then residual hypertension mainly involves the adolescent age. When already hypertension has started, uh, in very young um, kids, you often don't get so much of hypertension if repaired in the correct time. Perioperative mortality for isolated coarctation is low and ranges about to 0.8 to about 5 percent. But higher mortality occurs in neonates and infants in presence of perioperative cardiac failure or shock. So, what are the mechanisms of recoarctation post surgery? Neonates have 10 to 40 percent recoarctation rate according to this particular study by Andrew et al. Migration of the ductal tissue into the aortic valve long, longitudinally and circumferentially is probably the mechanism. And recoarctation is reported more often in neonates having subclavian flap autoplasty in which ductal tissue was retained. So these are the situations where you can expect a recoarctation. So what's the controversy between surgery versus balloon? The neonatal population data suggests that role of balloon angioplasty is palliative with the majority of angioplasty patients requiring surgery within the first year of life. Balloon angioplasty, however, appears to offer excellent results for palliation uh, in small uh, critically ill units with cooperation and associated medical conditions making them non-surgical candidate at the time of presentation. And balloon angioplasty is definitely 
has a major role in post-surgical cooperation, that is re-cooperation. So, venonangioplasty works by producing a tear in the thick and intima and media of the narrow aortic segment, dilating the obstruction. And this could <coughs> extend into the healthy adjacent aorta, causing a rupture or aneurysm. So, venonangioplasty is not a very safe procedure, but then if done in controlled hands, uh, it sometimes gives a lot of relief. Generally avoided in first to six to twelve months of life in patients with native cooperation because the high risk of recooperation, recoil of ductal tissue. There is uh, about seventeen percent risk of aneurysm formation, and of course, in very tiny kids, we can have we can damage the femoral artery. But there are some indications with for primary angioplasty and come I mean choice over surgery. In units with left ventricle dysfunction, CHF and shock, and associated medical conditions like prior cerebral hemorrhage or some associated other medical condition, liver dysfunction, biliary atresia, these sort of things. So balloon sizing, initial balloon dilatation is performed with a balloon whose diameter is average of the aortic isthmus or transverse arch and descending out at the level of diaphragm. So what we do normally when a patient is being taken up for balloon angioplasty in a cooperation scenario, <coughs> whoever does the echo for that patient, it is mandatory to give all the sizings in the report. Like you need to write the narrowest segment, the diameter of the transverse aortic arch, normal transverse aortic arch. And then the descending at the level of aorta at the level of diaphragm. All this information should be there in the echo report preceding the intervention. And then when we uh, go to dilate the cooperation, after we have done the NGO, we again measure all these things and then correlate with the echo measurements and then decide on the balloon size. But if there is no adequate relief of obstruction, the maximum balloon as large as the diameter of the DTA at the level of the diaphragm can be taken but do not exceed the diameter of the DTA at the level of the diaphragm. And never, never aim to dilate a coarctation to the best possible uh, image, because do not try to be, <coughs> sorry, perfect when you are dilating a coarctation. Because if you try to be perfect angiographically to dilate a coarctation, you might land up in rupture, aneurysm, all those things. So. Your idea should be about, um, by angio, about 80, 70 to 80 percent result is enough to tide over the crisis. So post dilatation catheter manipulation, this is uh, very, very important. And every time I dilate a quart, I definitely tell my uh, fellows to this particular uh, information. The tips of catheter should not be manipulated over the freshly dilated quark segment to avoid aortic dissection. And a guide wire should always be left in place across the quark segment, and all angiographic and balloon dilatation catheters should be exchanged over a guide wire. So once you have dilated a quark, and it happens very regularly, this mistake. Once you have dilated a quark, and you take, suppose, a multipurpose catheter in the uh, transverse arch or ascending aorta, and you measure the, you take the pressure there. And a very common instinct is to pull back the catheter to get a pullback gradient across the cooperation. Please don't do this. You can take pullback gradients when you are do, doing, a, suppose, a balloon pulmonary uh, valvular plasty or a balloon aortic valvular plasty. You can pull back the in a bare catheter, but not, not in a coarctation. So what you should do is, once you have dilated the coarctation, your catheter is in the ascending aorta, you measure the pressure, then if you want to do the NGO, then pass a guide wire through that uh, catheter, and then pull back the wire and the, pull back the assembly, the catheter and the wire, and then come to the <coughs> post coarctation area, and then you take out the wire and again record the pressure. Do not take a pullback gradient with a bare catheter. 
This is very, very mandatory, and this carries a very high risk of aortic dissection. So what are the disadvantages of balloon dilatation? One is residual stenosis, recurrent co-optation, residual hypertension, not in neonates, of course, and then aneurysm, rupture, and vascular compromise. Access site complications like femoral artery trauma and occlusion, thrombus formation, not reversible, potentially causing growth impairment of the ipsilateral leg, like the leg becomes slightly smaller in comparison to the other leg. Umbilical artery sometimes <coughs> may be used for initial intervention if they're absolutely a few days old, but then sometimes balloon manipulation is slightly technically difficult uh, when you use the umbilical artery route. Uh, frequency of aneurysm formation may be underestimated because significant aneurysms are detected in the angioplasty population who require a second balloon dilatation because these aneurysms are often not very, very, not very clear by echocardiography. So most of the aneurysms have been found when the patient was decided uh, for a second balloon dilatation, and you do an angio and you find that there's a significant aneurysm undetected. So, frequency of aneurysm formation is really underestimated. MRI has proven to be an excellent non invasive method for morphological study of the aortic arch and is recommended for all patients after balloon angioplasty. A CT angio also is not a very uh, bad diagnostic tool. Now, primary stent therapy. We usually try to avoid stents in neonates and children. <coughs> we wait for them to grow up so that we can put the bigger size stents so that you don't have to uh, manipulate with the stent later on. So the high recurrence rate and more importantly, the unpredictability regarding the interval between balloon angioplasty and clinically relevant recurrence may argue in the favor of primary stent situation primary stent therapy in specific situations, but of course these are very specific situations. So uh, this is an original article in which uh, st palliative stents were uh, put in neonates and young infants. So they, they did in five patients, just see the indications. One had a cranial AV malformation with aneurysmal dilatation of the vein of gallon with coarctation, very sick patient. There was another one with a borderline left ventricle. There was another one with a critical aortic stenosis. This underwent two balloon dilatations, recurrent and sustained uh, VT with very poor uh, fractional shortening in the settings of high dose of inotropic therapy. The fourth case was a trisomy 18 to enable discontinuation of prostaglandin E because this child was on prostaglandin for uh, even after balloon dilatation for a for more than a month and preterm unit with tubular hypoplasia of the heart. So all these patients had uh, problems which was not amenable to balloon dilatation or by surgery. So the bailout situation they had put uh, primary stent. So in the first patient, that is the one with the cranial AV malformation. Stent was removed in entirety and end to end anastomosis was performed 77 days following uh, stent implantation. In the second patient, underwent elective, uh, second patient means the one with the borderline left ventricle. This underwent elective stent removal and extended arch repair 38 days following stent implantation. So these are all like bailout situations and these stents were easily removed, not easy, I would say but were electively removed uh, following in the follow up during surgery. So patient three was that critical aortic stenosis. So that went again selective stent removal and arch repair with 76 days after. And the one with trisomy 18, uh, surgical coax repair and VSD closure was accomplished 83 days after. And the last patient was uh, after nine weeks. And this is another study uh, by endo endovascular stenting as an emergency treatment for neonatal cooperation. This was again a very, uh, very, very sick, unstable unit in which they have described they have put a um, bailout stent. Stent removal as the stents having been left in situ for periods exceeding three months without adversely affecting surgery, subsequent surgery. So this 
in rat cases describes a series of three premature patients. Of the two survivors, one patient had the stent entirely removed four months later, and the stent could not could not be removed at surgery three months later in the other one. So, which patient <coughs> which patient will react in which way is not very very clear. And this is another transcendental study. There was no mention of any complications related to excision of the stented segment. There is another study which says the stent could be easily picked up by the surgeon if surgery was performed within few days after implantation and end after end arterectomy needed to be performed in some patients if the surgery got delayed. So different studies have different results. Few surgeons say that there is no problem, and few surgeons say though there is a hell lot of problem. So conclusions about primary stent therapy. Primary stent implantation for palliation of coarctation is technically feasible in preterm neonates and young infants, in whom surgery may be either risky or relatively contraindicated for a variety of reasons. An acute and early follow-up results are sufficiently encouraging to consider further evaluation of this approach. Like when you are absolutely stuck to the wall, then probably you can use this, this bailout therapy. Advantages of stent implantation, of course, not only for units, for any <coughs> age, is preventing elastic recoil of the stented segment, negating the influence of ductal constriction, and it avoids over dilatation of the stenotic segment because there you can achieve a 100% angiographic result, and <coughs> of course there is this decreased risk of aneurysm formation. But then definitely, definitely you should have covered stents available on the shelf of your cat lab when you are planning to do all these <coughs> dangerous interventions. Even when you are doing a balloon dilatation, it is mandatory. I understand this is not always possible, but it's mandatory that you have a cover stent on the shelf of the cat lab. And in very small uh, neonates, when you are using a balloon uh, angioplasty, when you are doing a balloon angioplasty, maybe uh, a coronary stent, a coronary stent might sometimes bail you out if you have a sudden dissection or rapture, because coronary uh, covered stents are usually <coughs> present in the cat lab. So make sure that at least they are present when you are dilating in your neonate coarctation. Future trends are, of course, biodegradable stents, growth stents. Now, growth stents is a balloon expandable metal stents. Two longitudinal halves are connected with bioabsorbable sutures so that a circular stent is created. And it is postulated that after absorption of the sutures, the stent would not impede growth. 20 of these uh, stents were implanted in the aorta, pulmonary artery, and IVC of piglets. None of the stented vessels showed any significant stenosis or pressure gradient documented by angiography or uh, catheter pullback. So during fluoroscopy, the two halves of the stents were clearly separated in all animals, and the growth stent has the potentially to be non-restrictive during vessel growth, and thus is definitely a promising new device for the permanent treatment of stenotic vessels in infancy and childhood. This is how the growth stents look like. And see, if you look carefully, uh, this was the original stent and how these switches are giving away. And you can redilate them later on. So early and midterm results with growth stents, a possible concept for transcatheter treatment of aortic coarctation from infancy to adulthood by stent implantation. This is a study from Germany. Uh, they aim to evaluate the growth stent for the treatment of aortic coarctation in infants. Pressure gradients immediately after stent implantation decreased from 30 to 8 millimeters of mercury. And they concluded that it is suitable for treat, acute treatment of aortic coarctation in infants and can be overstented later on if necessary with a larger stent without causing any sort of restriction. <coughs> Biodegradable stents. Uh, these are polymeric materials and being widely studied nowadays. I mean, a lot of things like devices, everything, are, and people are studying on this biodegradable material. During bioabsorption, bio these long chains are hydrolyzed, phagocytosed, and degraded to lactic acid, carbon dioxide, and water, and eliminated via the Krebs cycle. This is basically the philosophy behind this biodegradable stents. And degradation uh, times for polymeric stents tend to vary and range from 
six months to over uh, 24 months. Magnesium alloy is commonly used in the construction of these uh, biodegradable stents, and they're available in 3, 3.5, and 4 millimeter in diameter, uh, but definitely not widely available. So this is another study, and they have used these bioabsorbable bio metal stents in a new one. This is how they look. They have different complex names to these polymer stents. This is how they look. So, <coughs> to conclude, surgery is still the treatment of choice in stable units with coaptation. Balloon angioplasty is an effective interim palliation discrete coaptation in critically ill neonates. Stent implantation is an in alternative uh, interim palliation in coaptation associated with other systemic abnormality such as arch hyperplasia, borderline left ventricle, some other associated system abnormalities. Growth stent is suitable for the acute treatment of aortic coaptation in infants, which needs further uh, validation. And biodegradable stents are yet to be used. So now, a few questions for all the people who have come. Okay, the first question: How many of you have done primary coaptation stenting in units? Have done or done a scene being done? Primary co-op stenting in units. Dr. Trupti says one. Uh, what was the indication in that particular patient? Even uh, so a lot of people have experience. Looks like I would like to know what was the indications in indication in that particular patient of yours. Baby was in shock, severe acidosis. So, wouldn't have a balloon angioplasty would have, would have bailed out the situation? Dr. Shaba, uh, Shada, what was uh, your indication? Sick newborn. Okay. No, now, my question is why only balloon, uh, balloon angioplasty alone was not sufficient in, this, uh, in these patients? What was the reason? Tried, it failed. All right. And uh, yeah, but okay. So this was like a, a, again a bailout situation. I understand that as a bailout procedure. Yes. So primary stent cooptation is uh, we have never done it in our institute. Okay. Next question: How many of you <coughs> would routinely do balloon dilatation or native cooptation, irrespective of LV dysfunction? Means if, even if the LV function is good, how many of you would do balloon dilatation of native neonatal cooperation? Just yes or no, that should be enough. No, no, everyone agrees, no, no. Good. So that is a very important lesson that if a native cooperation is there, please do not attempt to do a balloon dilatation if the LV function is good. Okay, how many would do balloon dilatation only when there is LV dysfunction at a critical limit? Like this particular echo. Or would you would your surgeons be happy to uh, take up this case for surgery? Yes, some answers. So how many would do? How many of you would do balloon dilatation in this particular uh, clinical scenario? Am I still heard? Or the link is gone? No answers. Yes, Dr. Chupti, Dr. Shadab, any answer? Dr. Vimla? Dr. 
they would not do uh, the loom dilutations in this looks like so the answer is the same as before yes why not <coughs> in this scenario in this scenario in particular this sort of lv dysfunction the neurates are usually very sick they are very sick in acidosis and all so in these situations if you are doing a um, balloon dilatation uh, you are not very unjustified you can do to bail out the situation and we have seen uh, several uh, neonates coming in this shock state and you do the balloon dilatation and uh, you can usually discharge them within a few days but then if you do uh, attempt to do surgery you have sometimes a lot of problems and these patients sometimes won't come, come out so uh, in these critical situations when there is severe LV dysfunction shock acidosis it is not very unjustified to do um, balloon dilatation and uh, we have seen uh, we have a lot of centers do like routine balloon dilatation whatever may be the scenario but uh, in our institute the policy is to do balloon dilatation of neonatal cooperation only when there is LV dysfunction or the neonatal is very uh, sick medically so how many of you would never do balloon dilatations and always send for surgery any comments never do balloon dilatation and send for surgery no answers at all yes yes i think that's yeah you, you should always send the patients for surgeries because surgery is the treatment of choice and uh, but so to sum up to sum up actually in coarctation uh, <coughs> if the <coughs> patient is stable and has a coarctation with good LV function with no other antecedent factors you definitely should send the patient for surgery because that's the treatment of choice for coarctation but if the neonates are sick with very bad LV uh, dysfunction then probably we can do a balloon dilatation to bail out the situation and uh, definitely uh, other important message for all of you is do not cross a, a dilated coax segment with a bare catheter definitely do it over a guide wire and do not take a pullback gradient of the coarctate uh, of the dilated coax segment with a bare catheter just like that put the wire again back take out the whole assembly out and then take a pressure distally all right so that's all the conclusion and thank you thank you everybody all right